Well, hello and welcome. I would like to thank everyone for coming. I'd like to acknowledge the original people of this territory that we're meeting on. And um, be before we begin the panel, I'd like to call on uh, Shirley Descharm to um, say an opening prayer for us, please. And I'm going to do the opening prayer in my language. Igosani, kisimantu, nanaskumanana nuhutsu tagapi mama opia, matika mai hiu hiagupi moi mustata, tawichiha minata maskei gapoya umagapi isi, pagosi de moa, Mina naskuminan kapin to tamagi chigugo, igonig mino isto, so we dimik, tansito tayamichik, mina gotagaki de New York, kapin to tayamichik, igonig mina, kita kinto tamatnan, we sto a hido tapmotachik, midoin isi, tasin sito tagoma, aumanidanan, ed in New York, kapi se hide pagamiscagoa, magagida, kasugi gapoin. Thank you, Shirley. Okay, well, uh, then we'll do some introductions. Uh, as you know, we're here to, um, as part of the Waniskatan Research Alliance to talk about hydro dams in Manitoba Cree. Um, I'm Jarvis Brownlee. I'll be moderating the panel. I'm a, a university researcher from the University of Manitoba and I'm part of the research group that's been working with the folks from um, indigenous communities, these are all Cree people actually, who've been affected by hydro dams. So I'm, I'm basically here to moderate and, and pose the questions. We have, um, we have some video footage that just shows um, some of the hydro dams. We're talking about the waterways and the damage from, from the dams, the dam damage. Okay, so, uh, and now I'll ask uh, the rest of the panel to introduce themselves, starting with Les Dysart at the far end. Good afternoon. My name is uh, Leslie Dysart. I'm from uh, South Indian Lake, uh, located in northern Manitoba, Canada. It's also known as the Opipanapiwan Cree Nation. I'm a hunter, a trapper, and a fisher, but I'm also, I'm also a chief executive officer of an, a community organization that has signed agreement with Ma the Manitoba government and the Crown Corporation of Manitoba Hydro. But I'm also a father who uh, has a duty to protect his children and try to uh, advocate for positive change on the ongoing destruction of our lands and waters and communities. My name is uh, Shirley uh, Ducharme, uh, Chief from Opipanapiwin uh, Cree Nation, Southern Indian Lake, Manitoba. Uh, Leslie and I are from the same community, and I am uh, chief of the community and uh, strongly advocating for our people. We have been faced with so much uh, impact with hydro, mega hydro development projects, and mainly we have grown to see the ongoing impacts of the uh, hydro generating power, and I think that we deserve as a minority indigenous group. We deserve the right to be heard. And I'm very grateful that we have this opportunity to speak on behalf of our nations. And thank you, I'm also a grandmother and also a leader that is looking forward again to make change for this devastating damage to our community. Thank you so much. Okay. Good afternoon. It is an honor to be here to take part of this event and to be given a chance to say a few words. First of all, I would like to introduce myself. My name is Betty Lo Halkro. I am a traditional chief of Pimichikamakukimawin Women's Council. My community has been deeply impacted by hydro developers and we continue to feel the impacts of projects construction for more than four decades. Pimichikama government is based on self-determination. It is related to, but constitutionally, legally, historically, and administratively distinct from the Cross Lake First Nation, which is a statutory creation that provides services on behalf of Canadian government. Historically, our ancestors governed themselves in our territory. It did not have rulers, it had leaders. 
Leadership was based on consensus and especially upon aspect that was earned. The Mitzkamak leaders were respected persons. They held their position as long as they had the respect of the people. Oral history tells us that the elders and women play a distinct role in governance. Many stories say that the elders had a role in speaking of the law, and the woman had a role in organizing the Mitzkamak society. Both came into play at summer gatherings. This is how the Mitzkamak constitution came into being from these times. It rests upon custom and is largely oral. The Mitzikamak Four Council de derives from its traditional form of governance, which includes the elders and the women's council. Elders and women's. Its council is elected by its own constituency under its own rules and function and its own rule by consensus. National policy established by consensus of the Four Council. In order for a policy to be passed, it must be agreed upon by the Four Council and the people. The council are subject to Pimitskamak law. Pimitskamak law requires the executive council to give effect to a national policy because the traditional council can call an executive council election at any time. And its members are the band council members are the ex officio. The band council tends to regard Pimitskamak national policy as persuasive. The Government of Canada has not acknowledged Pemichikama customary government in modern times. The federal government supports the concepts of self-government being exercised by Aboriginal nations and other larger groups of Aboriginal people. However, it does not accept the Aboriginal people may exercise the right without first negotiating, negotiating it, which means in order for you as an Aboriginal nation to serve self-determination and to have self-government, you must get their approval first. Thank you very much. I am Betty Lou Halkru, the Women's Chief of the Mitzikamakri Nation. Yeah. Uh, Dance, I, uh, my name is Ramona Nekaway. Um, unfortunately, I'm not able to speak um, in the way Chief Alcro has uh, introduced herself because I'm uh, a generation of uh, Indigenous people in, in Canada that uh, has lost their language due to government policy and government, um, you know, various uh, policies um, in, 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 in the land that we come from. And so me, I'm an Indigenous academic, so uh, like uh, Dr. Brownlee, I'm um, a researcher working with Waniskatan, and Waniskatan means rise up or wake up. Uh, in, in our language. And so I, uh, I work at a university or a post-secondary institution um, in northern Manitoba. Uh, we'll show a map in a little bit here to get some a geographical bearing of, of where we come from. Um, but as a hydro-affected Cree woman, a lot of my research is impacted by who I am as Idinu, as Cree. Uh, as, as a woman, as a mother, and as a grandmother, and so um, the research that I am involved in is heavily influenced by each of these sites. So, you know, I was born into a hydro-affected reality, and so we'll talk a little bit about what that means as we uh, proceed uh, with, with our conversation today. But ultimately, this means I was born into devastated lands and into a devastated landscape. Our waters were contaminated. Our waterways are heavily impacted by the presence of um, developers in our territory. So, um, you know, I, I'm not going to get into a whole lot here, but this is to say that my academic interests are, are really shaped um, by the various experiences um, with developers, with governments, with other entities coming into our territories. And so I sit here. Um, you know, in, in sort of a, in, in a double role as an Indigenous woman, but also as an academic, an Indigenous academic, trying to help um, document and, and, and capture some of the narratives and some of the histories in our territory. Thanks. Thanks, Ramona. 
Okay, thanks. Thanks to the panel for introducing themselves. Um, and then Ramona, you want to go next? So Ramona and I are, are just since you're all from different places and don't um, really know too much about the context, we thought we'd just give you a little bit of an overview of um, you know where we're coming from, the the the, the peoples that we're talking about, and uh, and Ramona will do that, and I will then talk just a little bit quickly about sort of. Canada and treaties and Canadian law, just to fill you in a bit. You probably come here thinking Canada is a great champion of human rights and, um, and you know, a, and the, the peacekeeping nation, uh, but unfortunately it's a little bit more complicated. So Ramona, do you want to start? And so I just want to draw your attention to this kind of loop, that, this feed that we're seeing as, as we're talking. And so these are some images from our territory. So actually, you know, Although we're sitting here together, we kind of come from different areas in our territory. And so I'll show you those on the map. But each of these um, areas are, are kind of sites where uh, development or, or this activity has taken place. And so uh, you'll see kind of a reference to different um, stations, different sites in, 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 in the north where we come from. And so we live kind of in the center of, of, of the, uh, or we're from the center of, of uh, the country. And so this is Manitoba. Um, and we're actually from communities in northern Manitoba. And so we're Cree. We call ourselves Idinuak or Ininuak. And this is, um, you know, just a snapshot of, of some of the transmission lines and some of the transmission grids in our territory. And so the blue lines um, are the transmission uh, network that kind of comes from the north and carries energy down into the southern part of the province and then into markets and, and into uh, areas beyond the province. And so the red one, the blue line is a little more historic. These are, uh, this is activity that took place in the, in the 70s um, mostly. Uh, the red line is more recent activity that had taken place in the, the 2000s, correct me if I'm wrong, Les. Yeah. Okay, and so this is just another viewpoint of, of, uh, uh, of the area that we come from, the province that, that we come from. Um, you can click it again. And so this is the community that I'm from. It's called Nistuayasig. Uh, there's another one. Click again. Uh, that the, the stars are the communities that uh, Chief Halcro and Chief Ducharme uh, come from. The north is, uh, in English, it's called South Indian Lake. The, 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 the star to the bottom right is Pimichikamak, and that's where Chief Halcro um, is from. And so today we're going to really be focusing on some of the history and maybe referencing some of the history. So I thought it was important to maybe start with a super brief overview. So our territory has been, um, we've experienced two waves of this kind of development in our, uh, it, it, this activity in our territory. And really it speaks to three agreements. There are three agreements involved. And, uh, you know, I think current, I think there's currently five generations impacted um, by this development. So each of us kind of represents one of those generations. So my last count, uh, that there's, there's five since 1970s, late 1960s. So, you know, dam building in the territory necessarily kind of involves agreement making. And so for us in, in, in um, where we are, the process was governed, uh, by a number of uh, processes. We have the Northern Flood Agreement that actually should say Northern Flood Agreement. We've got another set of agreements that are called implementation agreements. A third set, the most recent set, um, are partnership agreements. These agreements involve uh, First Nations communities. Initially, uh, it was the Northern Flood Committee, um, but it's important to note that not all Cree communities were um, dealt with in this particular round um, with regard to some of the impacts. Um, so you've also got Manitoba, uh, the, the province of Manitoba, um, the hydroelectric board who's Manitoba Hydro, and then of course Canada was party to the agreement. Disregard the IF. Um, IFTNHD. <laughs> yeah, so we won't talk about that, but that disregard that. Yeah, keep going. And so just, you know, we're getting a little closer into our territory and this is the, these are the areas that we're going to be speaking about today. So really what happened in, in this time, um, 
you know, was that industry rerouted in, an entire river into another river so that it would generate capacity and excess volume um, into into waters, reversing entire rivers, um, you know, building channels that had not been there to allow the water to go through so that uh, the water could be manipulated um, and increase flows um, in a different part where you see the circles down the river there. So the red is actually where uh, Les and I come from and Chief Halcro comes from waters where uh, it's colored in yellow. But this is again just an overview so you can maybe get a little bit of a visual in terms of what we're talking about today. Um, so the red, uh, you know, that um, Les might speak a little bit to the rerouting of that water. So that's not the natural flow of the water in red. That water was diverted from one major river into another uh, major river. Um, hence, our, you know, the community that I come was, from is, uh, was flooded and continues to be flooded as a result of the movement of that water. Um, so dam, uh, dam making and deal making. Um, so this is really, it, it was a, a quite a, you know, an involved process, I guess. And so, t you know, when you look at each of these components, it's more than just about a single generating station. You've got the transmission network that's part of that. You've got um, Lake Winnipeg regulation and, and what's called the Churchill River uh, regulation. So that was the red arm that you, uh, the red piece of the map that we just saw. The Lake Winnipeg regulation is the yellow piece. Um, so... Michael, I'm sorry. Yeah, so anyway, so you've got those two components and then the red that I initially showed you, the different corridors bringing the transmission lines down, that's another piece. But this is just to say, it, you know, it, it's a pretty um, big network. And, uh, and, and so some of the work that we do at Waniskat then, again, you know, this is an interesting kind of uh, partnership or collaboration between researchers from universities, uh, folks from NGO communities, uh, NGO organizations, but also people um, from hydro-affected communities and other Indigenous communities. So we do, you know, work in advocacy, critical research, education. So if you're interested and want more information, there's the um, our website. I've also got some cards about an academic conference that's upcoming, uh, if you're interested, and be happy to share that with you. But that's enough for me for now. Good job. Well, not just an academic conference, because we do want, we want community members. Really, the, the core of the alliance is, is the community people. And, and what they've been going through and what they have to say. And the Alliance exists to help, help them get the word out, get their voices heard, and, and try to make change in a, in a positive way. Okay, well, uh, we tried to divide things up so we're not covering exactly the same thing. So what, what I wanna talk about, so you've, had an, you've got an overview now of sort of how the, the, the dam, how extensive this system of dams is. This process has been going on you know, since the 1960s, basically since technology developed to the point where electrical, where electricity could be um, transferred over long distances without losing very much power. And that's when Canada was able to move into the north, into indigenous territories, and build massive mega projects of hydroelectric, to generate hydroelectric power. And this is when the communities began to feel the effects. In this image, you see what's been happening to the shoreline of South Indian Lake, where um, Les and, and Shirley are from. Um, they said that the shorelines would uh, be damaged for a while, for about 10 years, and then they would stabilize. Unfortunately, that was incorrect. They have never stopped collapsing, so they just keep collapsing into the lake, trees collapsing into the lake. Anyway, Les will tell you more about how that works, but that's what the image is. So here's that uh, map again. We've seen it already. So I'll just say briefly that, again, you see how extensive this network is. And you know the, the, uh, the power for the entire province is generated in the indigenous territories that we're talking about and then transmitted down to the south and, and also exported to um, uh, mostly to the United States, actually. And so it's, um, it's an, an export product that uh, Manitoba benefits from. Uh, so here, this is uh, just another version of a, a map that shows you how it works. So the two large rivers, um, so here's the Nelson River. It's one of the largest rivers in the province. It's the one that has the best dam sites, so that's where the biggest dams are located. And now in order to maximize the power generation, you can't 
store power for long periods, but you can store and hold back water. So what they did is they took this other huge river, the Churchill River, and instead of building dams on it too, they reversed the whole river through South Indian Lake, turned South Indian Lake into a giant reservoir, and channeled the water through the Nelson River. So they have massively um, reorganized the water regime in, in huge areas of the province, and that's where a lot of the damage comes from. Okay, so I'll just talk very briefly about, about Canada. It has this international reputation as uh, a peacekeeper and a defender of human rights. And, um, you know, that is a sincere belief of Canadians, but unfortunately there's this kind of blind spot when it comes to the interior of the country and especially when it comes to Indigenous people. There's a whole colonial narrative about how, uh, you know, these aren't really human rights violations. So, um, Basically, since the 1950s, a growing part of Canada's economy has been built on resource extraction in the north, in, in indigenous territories that were undamaged until that time, where indigenous peoples were still living off the land and taking care of the land. And so, indigenous peoples and their lands have been sacrificed in order to, literally, to power Canada's economy and to generate wealth for non-Indigenous people in southern Canada, and of course for international investors as well. So um, Canada has a history of, of making treaties with uh, Indigenous peoples, as has already been mentioned. The people that we're talking about today uh, made, made treaty, what's called Treaty Number no. 5 with Canada. It was signed originally in 1875, and then other groups joined the same treaty in 1908. When, when the Cree people signed Treaty 5, their understanding of the agreement they had made was that this agreement, the treaty, would protect them. It would protect their lands and their way of life and their culture. Unfortunately, Canada had the opposite understanding. Canada saw the treaty as giving it permission to come in and destroy those lands and those cultures. Of course, they don't call it destruction, they call it economic development, but uh, that's a nice term. <laughs> but really, when it, for indigenous people, what it is actually is destruction and devastation of their lands. Now, we, we also, of course, have the myth of hydroelectric power being green energy. You know, people think that it doesn't generate greenhouse gases, that it's not bad for the environment. But again, unfortunately, that's not the case. It causes a lot of damage, and you'll hear a lot more about the, the kinds of damage it causes. But just quickly, um, even in terms of greenhouse gases, it is actually negative because it, it causes the release of stored carbon dioxide um, in the land. It also um, causes the release of poisonous mercury into the waters, which poisons all the fish and animals and, and makes them unsafe to eat. Um, it destroys wetlands and forests. Um, and it kills a lot of fish and animals as well as trees and plants. Canada has a legal regime that should protect Indigenous people. Um, our treaties are protected under the Constitution. The Constitution says um, that Aboriginal and treaty rights are protected and, and must be observed. And as you see, it, it says explicitly existing Aboriginal and treaty rights are hereby recognized and affirmed. Um, our courts, for a long time, the courts of law in Canada did not protect treaty rights, but uh, beginning in the 1970s and 1980s, they did begin to protect treaty rights. It's sort of with the international shift towards, um, you know, decolonization and, and greater attention to human rights. So I've just put up some of the quotes from important court cases that just, just to give you a general sense of, of how strongly treaties are supposed to be protected in the courts. And again, so we, Treaty 5 should protect um, the Cree people who made that treaty. It should, anything that's doubtful should be liberally construed and resolved in their favor. The words in the treaty should be understood in the way they would have been understood by the Cree at the time. And at the time they were told, we'll all live as brothers, the queen is your mother, and, um, you know, we're making this treaty in order to live in peace together and, and you know, share the benefits of the land. 
Um, in, in terms of hunting and fishing rights, those things also should be, should be protected. And um, I want to highlight particularly that the treaty to protects not just hunting itself, but the ability, the ability to hunt, the ability to, be go, to go into the forest safely, the ability to go out on the water safely to hunt and to fish. And finally, um, I've just quoted this legal scholar, Patrick Macklem, who talks about the ways that treaties really uh, are very broad in their protection and that they, they protect rights to water as well. And finally, um, the courts have said that the Aboriginal right to harvest resources, as they have done, as they of their ancestors have done for centuries, that right is second only to conservation needs. So the first priority is to conserve the fish and the animals, and the next thing is Aboriginal rights. Anything else is ranked lower. So for instance, the ability to um, construct hydro dams, that should become behind treaty rights. Treaty rights are more important and are more protected. So that's how it's supposed to be under law, and um, we'll now talk about what it really looks like in practice. So I'm going to, uh, yeah, I'm going to ask uh, the panel some questions and, uh, and we'll start talking about what it really like, looks like for them in practice. So uh, first I'd just like to ask you, how have, I will, how have hydro dams affected you and your family and your community? And I'll ask Les to start, please. Well, in a word, I mean, devastation. It's very, the current or the past and current practices of Manitoba Hydro under the oversight of the Manitoba government has been pure devastation of not only our waters, but our lands, our economies, our community, and even our very culture. It's, it's, uh, it's affected us tremendously. I've, I've lived every second of my life under the oppression and devastation and harmful practices of uh, the Crown Corporation called Manitoba Hydro. We were uh, once a very proud, uh, independent, even prosperous uh, Northern Aboriginal Cree community. We uh, sustained ourselves through the natural resources. Uh, our area was rich in uh, fish and wildlife and we sustained ourselves. But in more modern times, we relied on our fishery, our commercial fishery, uh, right? We started commercial fishing Southern Indian Lake in the surrounding area since 1941. But we fished these areas for thousands of years since the, the beginning of time. Uh, but again, in, since 1941, we were known as the third largest whitefish fishery in North America. So from the Northern boundaries of Canada, right into the Arctic to the Southern boundaries as we know the modern uh, uh, country boundaries, we were the third largest. This remote, northern, hard to access community of roughly 600 people was the third largest fishery in North America. We're down to less than a tenth of that. We're, we're hanging on by our, our fingernails. Uh, we're in sur pure survival mode. Um, I'm, I'm the th third generation person from my family who is uh, trying to advocate and but also educate not only Hydro but uh, Manitoba government, even Canada, and now the world stage here of the, the atrocities that are going on in northern Manitoba. Canada is well known throughout the world as a leader in um, you know peacekeeping and, and, and harmony and things like that. But if you look a little closer uh, of what's going on in northern Canada, it's 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 destruction. It's pure and utter destruction going on of um, Aboriginal lands and waters and people and communities and cultures. Um, it, it's been a really a deep effect um, that Manitoba Hydro is currently proposing to make permanent into the future. Right now, Manitoba Hydro operates under a loose arrangement with, with uh, Manitoba as the regulator but they're currently proposing a permanent arrangement to continue these destructions and even worse into the future. The issues of the past, as they call them, are over and we need to move forward. 
this destruction you see or have seen is continuing and even worsening. And Manitoba Hydro is proposing they go further into the future. And that's why we're here today. I mean, to speak of uh, how they affect your family, it's, it's very difficult. Um, we watch all through our lives uh, the destruction and the continued destruction of our, of our homes, basically, and how that um, impacts us negatively. Um, I've tried, me and my wife have tried to protect our children from uh, some of these negative experiences, uh, but in a sense it's, it almost falls into the practice of colonialism because you're taking away Aboriginal teachings, uh, learnings from uh, children's um, future, you know. I guess worldwide, once you start taking children away from their teachings, Aboriginal children specifically, uh, it's a loss that perhaps can never be gained back. So it's, it's very difficult to find the balance in day-to-day uh, -day life. Uh, as, as I introduced myself, I'm an I'm active hunter, trapper, fisher, uh, but I, I'm also uh, an office person, and I've participated for well over uh, the last two decades in all processes that are available, uh, both regulatory and just advocacy, to bring attention to these matters. The Manitoba government and Manitoba are well aware of the devastation going on in northern Manitoba under the extreme practices and operations of Manitoba Hydro. At this point, they just do not care. It's profits over people. But in more recent times, there is no profits generally being made in northern Manitoba. These, um, the second wave that uh, Ramona talked about of power generation and so-called partnerships with First Nation people are failures economically. They are, there is no real revenue generation, well there is revenue generation, but there is no profits on, on the national, international market being generated by the, the most current dam was Squatum. And it can be foreseen probably for the next three or four decades or further into the future, the current dam being constructed called the Kias Dam in Northern Manitoba is doomed to the same, you know, failed and bloated projections that have been sold not only to the people of Manitoba, but also to the U.S. consumer and even internationally. You know, so this destruction that's gone on is, was in unnecessary, I've learned, and they could have paused and uh, prepared better, but currently that destruction that's going on is unnecessary and self-serving. Sorry, it took a little longer. Okay. My name is Shirley Ducharme, coming from... Uh Northern Manitoba, South Indian Lake, Opipanapi and Cree Nation, uh, Treaty 5 territory. Um, to me, these Manitoba hydro mega projects have had devastating impacts to us as Indigenous people in many ways. The destruction of a livelihood to once thriving prosperous nations in Northern Manitoba the richness of the land and the waters that provided us everything we needed in life now slowly disappearing, or I, I wouldn't say slowly, more fast. Pretty uh, uh, disheartening. The destruction of the economy, social culture, and health impacts we face today is very disheartening, as I mentioned. And I have lived and observed this as a child to now as a grandmother. Through sharing the story, just give me a second, of my late father, you will see what I mean by this. My father was a proud provider for his family before the flooding of Southern Indian Lake. He was an advocate fisherman. And the land and water that was rich, abundance of fish. And I'd see him come in every morning with great pride, coming from lifting his nets and us as family helping him 
cleaning the fish, to washing the fish boxes that the uh, fish were carried in to be transported. And um, every day, and some most days it'll be twice with five nets in the water. He'd have to go in the morning and also in the evening because he had to, you know, be able to uh, provide for the family. But it was so abundant that, you know, we were so proud of him. <laughs> Later, in the decline of the fishery, I saw him to be straight, the opposite person he was. He was no longer coming in us so proud. You could see that he was oh so determined and try hard because after the uh, raising of the water in the flood, the fish disappeared. And at this time, comparing to what he was able to provide for his family, he'd go once, once a day to live. And it, with 10 nets, he'd be lucky to catch a tub or two. And you could see him as the years went on to 1980s. You could see that tirelessly he worked, but no gains. Even trying his old fishing spots, fish were not there. And every day he'd go in the morning, he'd move the nets to see if he could find these fish. Where, where are they? <laughs> to no success. And even hunting and gathering is our way of life. That's no longer there. The animals, you know, you'd have to go further inland to where the animals are now because there are no marshes where they feed. You'd have to go further. And again, when he'd go, he'd go for days. And before the flood, he'd just go within maybe half hour, he'd be back uh, with, uh, you know, moose meat or whatever animals that he brought in and we'd have the food there. And I'd like to refer to one of the, um, the pictures there with the island floating and you see these e e seagulls that are just flying around there and that's one of our traditional ways gathering seagull eggs and now these birds they can't even find an island where they they normally would nest and I'd like to uh, just share from one of the elders down below the falls where the dam is he shared a story with me and it's so sad when he told me that um, below the fo falls, my girl, I went one time and I knew the areas where the seagulls would be nesting. So he went below the falls. But then when the water rised, he says, you should have seen thousands, thousands of these seagull eggs floating. And they're no good. Like, you know, the, um, the birds will not regenerate. Those eggs are floating away. That's pretty, you know, pretty sad. Hang on. And one of the things that clearly stood uh, in my mind and to my heart, when it came time that m even our elders knew what was going to happen, but when they, when they knew, they spoke when they were negotiating. They weren't listened to. They, they knew this was going to happen to our community. They knew everything would be gone eventually. And it's to this day, we're still facing that. The land washing away. And now we have bigger lakes. And every, we had seasonal events. Every time we'd go to a fish camp, all our family would be there. Now I can't even take my grandchildren over there. I can't bear to see that my dad's cabin is almost in the water now. That's what I've been told, but I can't go there. It's, it's too hard for me. And I don't want my grandchildren to see that. And to us as uh, Aboriginal people, we were told to carry on our tradition. But now with this, 
how can you? Another thing that I want to mention is, well, that I clearly rem remember, is when we were told to move because our, our community was in a lower level of uh, land, and we were told that we had to move because eventually this whole point where we were situated would be underwater. And that's exactly what we're seeing. So we had to move to a higher ground. But when we were asked to do that, our parents were told, my father, they were told that they had to burn their homes down. That's another thing that will always, you know, stay with me. How can, you know, individual that build their own home you know, be asked to do that. You had no choice. They had to do it. And today we are trying so hard to pr protect our resources. What is still left to continue our traditional hunt and uh, gathers. It's pretty hard to do. But in our view, Manitoba Hydro is the biggest water polluter in the province of Manitoba and one of the biggest greenhouse gases uh, contributors, all the vegetation and trees they flooded are still there quietly ro rotting away, releasing methane gas. And with the deviation from the original Churchill River diversion, the augmented flow program, they are continuously eroding permafrost, which is in turn releasing mercury into the water. And think about the fish and the animals. Um, what they have done and still are doing to our communities uh, in short of economy, social and culture genocide, I think have been mentioned. But I'll, one of the example that I want you to kind of visualize is uh, during spring break up, you'll see the clearness of the water. But once the water opens up in summertime and the winds come in, that water is total, totally uh, murky, muddy water. And I just want to give you an example when it's springtime and the water is clear. If you're boating and you're looking down, you'll see trees standing under that water. And you very, have to be very cautious in where you're taking your boat, otherwise you'll you know, damage your motor if you hit one of those uh, trees standing in the water. It's, it's so sickening. Canada, Manitoba have sacrificed our people, a minority group using our lake as a re res reservoir is not right. Egosani. Thank you, Shirley. Betty Lou. Hi, um, Betty Lou Halkro, Um Have hydro uh, mega project affected our families? Um, as a family, we used to go out camping, and we en we enjoyed the beautiful water with our parents a long time ago. And we received a lot, and during that time, we received a lot of teachings from our elders, right? Today, we can go to these same places. And since Manitoba Hydro has come to our territory, accessing these same lands, they're very dangerous and hazardous to travel. Very dangerous. Today, we go to these same places. We take a lot of food and water because we're not guaranteed to get food, like fish, etc. We can't drink water, and our loads are very heavy now, like more, mm -hmm. more so today than we were a child. We didn't really take anything out when we went camping when we were children, when our parents took us out. There was food there. The it's just living off the land. Today it's different. Community loss of culture, and there's a loss, loss lost our way of life. We lost our way of life. Like I said, as a family, we can't go back to these sites due to low waters. We can't get to them. And high waters is dangerous because of the floating of the uh, debris that's under. It's very dangerous. 
And uh, yeah, before the hydro project, we were a very vibrant and self-sustaining community and so proud. Uh, everything we needed to survive was there. But after the project, we, had, we no longer had that. There is an agreement on our and Northern Flood Agreement that there's a promise to eradicate mass poverty and employment uh, is very relevant today. Uh, and that's not um, mass poverty I'm talking about there. That's not happening. They never fulfilled their obligations in, in the agreement. So we're really still waiting for that that to happen, agreements on the uh, on that. Social issues are abound and we can blame it directly to the project and we do that. Um, but I want to tell you a little story uh, my father used to say. He was um, he used to be out advocating on Pimitikamak all over the place. He went all over. Um, he passed already. My father uh, used to say, I raised my children with food from the land. I had four boys and seven girls. He used to say that industry and the government devastated our way of life, he said. Imagine a madman coming into a place where my children are eating. And while I was feeding my children, and he threw a slaw pail wherever they were eating. Well, this is what happened to our children, he said. And this is, conti this is continuing to happen in our community. And that still hurts. Uh, we come across that, uh, that uh, what my dad had said, and this is just something that we have to carry on and tell the world what is happening in our community for the uh, this destruction of Manitoba Hydro. And uh, our people live their way of life before, before hydro dams in our lands. And FA, the Northern Flood Agreement by three governments, uh, and they had mentioned that. And we were promised a lot of stuff and that they never fulfilled their obligations. And that's why we're here today to, uh, to tell the world that there are agreements and they are not fulfilling their obligations. And all the damage that they have done in our communities, in the northern communities, and that's very uh, devastating. And it's very hard to uh, go about uh, and telling the world, like, you know, it's, it's very, we're very emotional because we are hurt as indigenous people. That's it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, so um, I'll spend a couple of minutes talking about uh, the ways that these uh, projects have impacted me and my family. So like I said at the beginning, I mean, I'm sitting here as a person who doesn't speak their language, doesn't have access to a lot of the cultural teachings, um, but for me personally, like there's a there, there's a great loss of culture that's taking place and that continues to take place, and it's uh, it's affecting two other generations. So you know, I'm a mom, but I'm also a grandmother. So because of my inability to acquire that knowledge, I'm unable to transmit that knowledge, and it makes it very difficult and quite challenging when we're unable to access the territories and the knowledge and the land base um, that were so important to our ancestors, to our relatives. Um, so, you know, uh, I, I've kind of called myself a child of the flood in, 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 recent, uh, in recent times. And I'm, I'm talking about the flood that we're seeing here, the, the raising of waters, the forcing, uh, sorry, the, 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 the movement of this water, and it's ongoing. So when energy is needed, water is going up you know, and coming down and going up. So this is a, you know, the, the water's fluctuating. And so at, at a local, like at a personal level, you know, there are impacts 
Um, but in terms of family, we also have intergenerational impacts. Like I said, there's five generations and counting that are impacted by uh, developers and, and, and uh, this presence in our territory. So, you know, I was born into this era, you know, Betty just talked about the Northern Flood Agreement. This was supposed to be the treaty, the agreement that would help mitigate and address some of the environmental, um, cultural, social, economic, legal impacts of, of, of this activity, of this process. So I was born into that. You know, my children were born into uh, an era where another agreement was made. Um, and these are called implementation agreements. My grandson is now born into an era where they've kind of come far away from the Northern Flood Agreement and now, um, you know, through this partnership process is effectively his generation and generations coming after him are going to uh, have to repay uh, some of the loans to kind of go into a partnership uh, agreement. I won't get into that here, but um, so each of our generations and my own family have been impacted. And of course, you know, I hear stories of my grandfather chasing surveyors away in our, in our fish camp where actually a hydro dam is now sitting. So we've got the CRD round, but we've got another round um, taking place. So like intergenerationally, we, we do have impacts and these are living effects that, uh, you know, that we're living with and we're trying to grapple with. And, um, you know, more broadly, I think it's already been said here that we, uh, you know, are continuing to experience some of these socioeconomic impacts. We're also experiencing cultural environmental and legal impacts of, of this presence in our territory. And so, you know, partly as a researcher, I, I like to try and work to unpack what, what, what that means and, and what that looks like. You know, but as a mom, I also want to look ahead and hopefully we, we, we can forge a different pathway for our children. I don't want them to be having these conversations in four decades from now in the same way that our grandparents had these conversations um, four decades ago. You know, so um, I, I, we need some kind of change, uh, and so I'll leave it at that. Thanks, Thanks so much, Ramona, and, and thank you to all of you for <clears throat> sharing your stories, which are very difficult and painful. So I, we're here to let people know about what's been happening and is still happening, but it is also true that these things can these things can be fixed, actually. Maybe not everything, but there are, we have, we have steps that can be taken to undo some of this damage and, and place us on a better course for the future. So my last question to the panel members is, uh, what steps can be taken now to undo the damage and resolve the problems that Manitoba Hydro has caused? And Les, I'll ask you to start. Um actually quite simple steps can be taken today, tomorrow. Um, Manitoba Hydro operates under a very, very loose arrangement under the provincial regulations with the Manitoba government. Manitoba Hydro was granted an interim license in 1973 to operate the Churchill River Diversion Project. They have gone outside of those terms of that interim license since 1979 and operated under a program called the Augmented Flow Program. This arrangement is very loose. It's not written in stone. It, it's, uh, it's not even legislation. Uh, it's a, a, a letter, a simple letter goes to the province annually from Manitoba Hydro and it's just signed simple approval by the minister of the day. At this time it's sustainable development. All the minister has to do is not sign the letter. There's no legislation forcing the minister to sign this. It's done by choice and the wish of Manitoba Hydro. That date is coming very soon, May, May 15th, I guess, if that's a deadline. If the minister chooses not to sign the augmented flow program, immediately there will be stabilizations on our lake and our river systems and naturally good things will happen. I mean, more efforts need to take place, but this is how, um, I mean, how simple it is. The, de the devastation and degradation of our environment, our communities uh, is ongoing and will get worse with the, pr with the approval of augmented pro flow program. It's, it's a death sentence. 
Manitoba Hydro wishes a permanent license that includes the augmented flow program. It wasn't articulated in the original uh, interim license of 1973. You lay those two documents side by side, they're two different hydraulic operations. So very quite easily steps can be taken to uh, improve the situation ongoing. Um, there's references to treaties and even a modern day treaty called the Northern Flood Agreement. Um, in some people's opinion, these treaties are all, they're obviously not perfect, uh, but they are still treaties recognized uh, nationally and internationally. But a situation gets worse with communities like South Indian Lake or specifically South Indian Lake. We were excluded from these processes. The Churchill River Diversion Project uh, to power the mega dams on the Lower Nelson River was uh, uh, the most major project of the day in Canada, if not the world at the time. They, they raised the level of South Indian Lake 10 feet, diverted 75% of the water from its natural flow down into the Lower Nelson system. Um, it's, it's been described by Dr. David Suzuki in, in uh, mid-90s as the, the biggest experiment in the world. Nobody can say with any certainty what is going to happen. But what I can say is if, if, if Manitoba Hydro is allowed to continue to the future with the augmented flow program, it's a death sentence for our community. With full knowledge of the Manitoba government and Canada. Canada is absent from these processes. So it, it likes to portray itself or belief that it's a world leader as a, as a good country and dealing with its people, you only have to look a little closer. South Indian Lake, as, as Chief Desharma said, and its people are being sacrificed for revenues, not necessarily profits. This needs to stop. Uh, you know, it's, I've, I've, I've lived this for, you know, almost five decades. I've, I've uh, investigated all the processes, reviewed the licenses, review, reviewed the, the systems and why things are done. I can safely say in a lot of confidence and proof that these things are not necessary and they're not necessary going into the future. Manitoba Hydro has lost a significant share of its market share in power sales. The power sales of today and into the future, going at least four decades, if not five decades, will be money losers for its, its current dam operations. We have an abundance power in Manitoba. We can't even, we're selling it at a loss. I mean, that's a fact and that's, it's well predicted it'll go in for next 40 or 50 years. They have a cross your fingers plan. They need to get in touch with reality and deal with it or we will. Yeah. Thanks, Les. Shirley. Basically, um, what you heard from Les, I think as a leader and a leader for our nation, that's one of the things we are, you know, already have discussed amongst our members, that we will stand against the Augmented Flow Program. Where it takes us, I hope for what we want, but we will be advocating for our people. And I think that's all I need to say on that. Thank you. Hi, it's Betty Lohalkro. Um, for me, the, uh, the natural um, environment is gone forever. And we can never replace what we had, one, what we had once to somehow mitigate the damage and that was done for our environment. For the, uh, the kids that are uh, swimming in our waters, they have uh, rashes. They have all sorts of, per I would say that there would be a lot of sicknesses that come from our water, you know. And um, to resolve the uh, problem in somewhat would be uh, maybe putting the uh, swimming pools for or outdoor rings for our youth start off like you know and um, 
helping in terms of monetary values, helping our grand traditional pursuits, duck hunting, moose hunting, hunting, etc. One thing that we can make happen is to have a good quality education system that will be uh, well funded. You know, because our funding is not as great for education system in uh, in Pimichikama. And that's all I can say for now. And I'll just pass it on to Ramona. Thank you. You know, I don't know if I have an answer for that. Um, I have a response necessarily for that question because I'm sitting here and I'm contemplating the experiences between each of our generations and they're quite stark. You know, but I, like I invite you to look at the, the, the photos. We see a lot of damage, we see a lot of devastation, but our land is beautiful. Our territory is beautiful. We come from the boreal forest, we're on the Canadian shield. You know, the, the, despite all of this, like our, our land is so beautiful and, and I don't know how we get to that place where we can um, enjoy the land the way that our, that, our, that our grandparents, that our ancestors did. But you know what, I think there needs to be some, some respect and there needs to be some recognition, uh, not necessarily recognition, but, but, but an understanding of, of how uh, important the land is and, and the water is uh, to who we are as, as a people. And, uh, you know, so I, I, I sit here as an individual, but I'm also a mom and, and a grandmother and a granddaughter and, um, you know, an indigenous person who, who's connected to this land and, and, and whose presence in this land predates the arrival of, uh, you know, colonial institutions and structures. And so I don't know that I have a response for that question. You know, we're still working through, but I think it's important to have conversations and to have dialogues and to have, um, you know, people be there who, uh, who share same uh, or similar uh, ideas, I guess, or, 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 or arrive at moments where if you don't agree, then, you know, <laughs> we'll talk your way through those some of those uh, processes. But decision makers need to need to understand who we are and where we come from and uh, how important the land and the water is to who we are. Thanks, Ramona. Okay, well, we've... Um We've sort of bombarded you with a lot of information and you're probably digesting it. But we did want to give you the opportunity to ask questions if you have any. Yes. Hi. Thank you for doing this. Um, my name is Lori Johnston. My people are Yamasi and we're, we suffer from nuclear energy development, a lot of water withdrawal and then contaminated rivers. And we have had some, there's a nuclear plant being constructed right now and the best traction that we've gotten is by exposing the subsidies and the corruption that go with it so that the non-natives don't really care whether we live or die but when they see that their money is going into this and that it's not you know they're subsidizing something corrupt then they want to stop it so I just suggested that I wanted to know if the color of the water the green is that natural or is that contaminant and have y'all proposed like a restoration plan to them and, and to shut down the dams? No, that, that's not a natural color of our water. Our waters used to be pristine, uh, clear, you know, you could see meters down into our lakes and rivers. This water is uh, artificially manually manipulated and there's constant erosion through the movement of water, but also through exacerbation of wind and, and waves. Why that water is discolored? Because it's actually eating away lands and, um, and trees uh, minute by minute annually. There's, there's anchors and anchors of boreal forest entering our water systems every year, along with uh, clays and organics. So that's not a natural color, no. Um, what is the second part of your question? To Um, yes and no. Um, we've, 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 I've, at least I've attempted and members of our community and different communities have attempted to work within the system, so to speak, 
uh, participating in uh, clean environmental commission hearings and a regulation body, public utility boards, talking with government, the various levels of government, right up to the ministers responsible for approvals of, of these projects and, uh, and the augmented flow program as such. Um, right at this moment, I've come to the conclusion they just don't care. That's part of the reason we're here today. You know, let's take our message, our story, our facts to the world stage and hopefully at some level, at least that Canada, Manitoba and Manitoba Hydro will start dealing with reality. If it takes the embarrassment of Canada, we're quite willing to go there. Canada should be ashamed of what's going on in their backyard, every Canadian. And this is every Canadian's backyard. If I can extend a little bit on that question. Um, the restore, uh, restore, uh, restoration, I guess, um, with Manitoba Hydro projects, they come into the, uh, our community and give us this uh, clean up your environment type of an attitude, which we have uh, projects to clean the shorelines, but that's insufficient. The only areas they look at is uh, where the camps were, but look at the, uh, the shorelines lots of uh, shoreline that still needs to be looked at but they they're not you know they're not uh, putting money in into this program to clean the whole lake no there's there's never been discussion on that they've only cleaned portions of where the camp old campsites used to be so i find that's just you know not going to get anywhere for uh, to clean up this mess it's going to take millions of years to do that with the amount of uh, the land that's already eroded and flooded. There you go, sir. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that question. I just want to interject quickly. You know, I, I saw not too long ago that there's an old dam on the Columbia River. They can't really upgrade it. They just blew it up. I, I keep thinking that seems like a good... <laughs> <laughs> a good start. Take the dams away. You know, we're losing I export markets that are the excuse for building most of these big dams because the people who were buying that power have solar and wind power now, uh, which is a lot safer and more environmentally friendly. So, you know, as Les keeps saying, you know, they're, they're, uh, they're, the decision makers are ignoring reality. But thank you for the question about uh, the restoration plan. We'll start working on that. Next question. As, <laughs> there, I, I want to thank you all for very informative uh, lectures here and uh, just tell that I recognize every single one of the arguments and also the part that uh, you come from a country that internationally is uh, pretty much recognized as a hu human rights paradise and I also happen to come from a country, Norway, who is recognized as a human rights paradise but beneath the surface there are very ugly deeds there. So, so every, every part of that is recognizable for, for me at least. Uh, also, uh, northern parts of, of Sápmi, or the whole of Norway, they have builded water plantations everywhere they can. Uh, between 96 and 99 percent of the electrical power in Norway is, uh, is from hydro dams. So they have built everything. Uh, but now, with climate change also, it's more, uh, more rain and uh, the reservoirs can take more, so they can upgrade that. But they can also build up, b build dams where, where they couldn't do it before because of the climate change. So the climate change also amplifies that, that impact on land. And our people have been relocated uh, many places, and uh, one of the biggest Sami fights also was over this water water dam project in Alta in 70s and 80s that uh, kind of ejected our political movement. And I don't have any question, I just recognize all this. And I want to, to uh, sincerely uh, state that if we can do anything in support, like support letters or something, and I'm thinking maybe especially about this May, deadline you mentioned, then we would happily provide that if it can help in any way. So I, I will reach to you in the, in the break now and we can exchange information. Thank you. Thank you so much. And that's exactly what we're looking for. People to work with who have similar struggles, we'll support your struggles and, and we would be very grateful for letters like that. Canada 
probably like Norway, is sensitive to that external pressure where it's not very sensitive to internal pressure from indigenous peoples, and I'm sure Norway is exactly the same. You know, we, they want to maintain this external reputation, and they don't like people knowing about the, as you say, what's going on beneath the surface. So we would be very grateful for um, support letters from you, and we would be happy to work with you to um, send support letters your way too. We, we are hoping partly to reach out and inform people, but also to make connections with people who have similar struggles. Thank you so much. My name is Susanna Sandoval, and I uh, answered the call to action. I've been doing a lot of different types of human rights, environmental rights work over the years, uh, as it relates to in, uh, indigenous uh, First Nations. Um, I'm Purepecha from Mexico, but I'm, um, I live in the United States. Um, I answered the call to action in Standing Rock, and so uh, for those of us who were there, our lives, we did a lot of work before Standing Rock. We did a lot of work during Standing Rock, and now we're in post-Standing Rock time. Um, the question that I had was in regards to, and I, might, I came in halfway, so you might have answered this, the legal aspect of it, because I was involved um, heavily um, with the tribal, both the tribal and the traditional elders in regards to um, working through um, the unfortunate Western court system and then looking at what is possible through the UN. And last year, there were a group of elders that gathered together and we built uh, and filed notice with the UN to let them know that we built three commissions. And so I serve, currently, I, yet last night I was elected as uh, the Secretary General for this council that was formulated in last year's permanent forum session. And um, I do both policy, I'm an organizer, I'm an activist, so you know, depending on what strategy is needed, um, I'm curious to hear one about your legal what legal action has been taken to, I'm willing to help build coalitions. I'd like to know how, what, how, how strong the coalition is that you have built through North America. One of the things that um, I went to the camp to help support is actually building that. I'm from Mexico, I live in the US, I've traveled in Canada. The, the reality is that the pipeline goes, at least the one that we were fighting in Sandy Rock, goes all the way through North America. I'm in Illinois, so part of the, the, um, the XL pipeline, we're one of the states that is part of one of the stops to it. And so I think part of it is how, do, how strong do we build the coalitions with each other? And what is your community willing to do at this point and what's necessary and how can we help equip? We've got a lot of water protectors from all over the world. There's a whole database of us that were there. Uh, and how do we help uh, not replicate what happened in Standing Rock in certain instances and prevent that, but how do we build an infrastructure that allows indigenous peoples to actually uh, get retribution and remuneration for our communities. I'm from a part in Chicago um, that was affected by the steel mills and we have, most people there have cancer based on the metals that were released into the environment. So it's personal for me of like my own legacy. And Mexico is a whole another conversation about our access to food, access to clean water. So I can relate to the issues, but one legal and two, how large of a coalition and what is it that you need? Um, well, two things. L our legal fight um, hasn't, we haven't taken that step. This is very now. My chief here uh, back in February sent a clear, uh, clear message to the minister in regard to the augmented flow program. And it's just not something we're like, you know, too bad it happened type of thing. Our agreement that was signed in 1992, signed by the Manitoba Hydro Crown Corporation and the Manitoba government, clearly articulates um, the augmented flow program and conditions under the augmented flow program, and just to paraphrase, basically it says the augmented flow program can be removed if those conditions are not met. Both Manitoba Hydro and the Manitoba government have refused to talk to us for the last six years, and they've played some politics, let's make a deal scenarios uh, with the past leadership. Um, 
at the end of the day, that just uh, gave them, bought them time to continue this destruction and earn more revenues, not necessarily profit again. I have to reinforce that. Their dams are currently losing money, their power sales. Secondly, uh, I'd like to, uh, the One Iskatan Hydro Alliance, which we're all members of, our communities are members of. Um, it's a very uh, well-organized organization. We'll get you the information to that. Um, so as far as, the, just to clarify, legal aspects, uh, we're, we're not like waiting and see. We're obviously taking some actions, but uh, we'll know the message or the, the position the government is taking very, very soon. Um, we have options. Um, I believe we have exhausted every regulatory uh, process just to, you know, the predetermined conclusions before you even enter these processes as people such as yourself as activists know. They're, they're just, you know, give the perception of doing something meaningful while the projects have were started and are almost complete, you know. So yes, um, well, just kind of stay tuned, I guess, and I, obviously we would appreciate the help and we'll, we'll give information on the, the Alliance and uh, have further discussions. But I think there is a question. Thanks, Les. Yeah, I really appreciate the question. <laughs> the uh, Juanis Gatan has been working now for, I guess it's three or four years, and really, until now, we've been focusing on trying to connect the communities within Manitoba, because as you know how it is, I mean, they sh they, they're actually, you know, they're families to each other, they're connected, they were connected in the past, but one of the most successful colonial strategies has been to, vi to divide and rule them. And unfortunately, Canada is very good at that. And so what we really have focused on until now is sort of documenting and gathering information and, um, and bringing people into the network to connect them up with each other. And um, I think that's, we've, we've come a long way in that regard. We have started to look into legal options um, and there are a, a couple of possible approaches. One is to work with the treaties and we have been looking at ways to do that. They actually have one treaty where they signed the wrong form. So the government people cut it up and sewed it onto a different form. <laughs> this is the stuff that happened. So, um, and as I said, our constitution should uh, the law is actually on our side, but you know how it is with courts, they aren't always. So we are proceeding sort of carefully, but I, I think that since we have, we've been trying to use regulatory measures and so on, and we have just exhausted those options, and I think that legal measures probably will be the next approach. And we will also continue political measures. The truth is with Canada, the two things that have really worked for Indigenous peoples to get some justice are court decisions and international pressure. Just, uh, there go. we go. Uh, so, Tansi, uh, Matthew Norris, Nita Nitsugashwan, Lakaran, Jotsi Nita. My name is Matthew Norris, I'm Woodlands Cree, and I ap apologize for my pronunciation. My mom, I'm still learning my language, and uh, my mom says I still pronounce it like a white guy. So, <laughs> I'm working on that. Um, but uh, one, one of the hats that I wear is I'm a policy analyst for the Union of BC Indian Chiefs in, in BC. And we've been uh, supporting the treat, some of the Treaty 8 First Nations in their opposition to the Site C Dam. Um, so, so one of my comments is that I'd be happy to, to make an introduction there to see if there are some, some potential partnership opportunities there. Um, my, and I guess that, that leads me to my questions, is that are, is the Manitoban government still pursuing new hydro projects? Uh, I, in, in BC, we're seeing BC's aggressively, BC and Canada are aggressively pursuing the Site C Dam, which, is, uh, which will destroy prime farmlands and, and traditional sites of the, of, uh, the Treaty 8 First Nations. Um, one of the things that we're noticing and so one of, the, one of the avenues that we're trying to oppose the project is through public pressure uh, within BC. But one of the difficulties there has been, first off, the, 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 the large voting population is in the municipal urban centers, trying to get uh, interest uh, and fervor in there is difficult. They see Site C as being not their issue, as being far up north with little impacts on on them, so trying to make it a 
uh, an election issue, and we're, and we're coming up to a federal election fairly soon. But the other issue that we're seeing in BC that I wonder if you could comment on from, from Manitoba is politicians are really presenting these hydro dams as a green alternative to, uh, which they're not. We know they're not at all. Uh, it's a it's a 50 year out of date technology that uh, no other country in the world is heavily pursuing anymore. We're seeing we're seeing other states actually demolishing their their dam projects in favor of um, uh, smaller projects. But maybe and that's another question I would have too is if you could comment on run of the river micro dam projects and the the impacts those have. I don't know if those are are common in Manitoba, but we're starting to see those in BC too. And, and we know those have impacts as well, but uh, it's also my unfamiliarity with these micro, micro dam projects, run of the river projects. So maybe you could comment on, on the existence of micro dams, the, the kind of green swing that governments are using to promote these projects, uh, and then if I can help in making those connections with the Treaty 8 First Nations, I'm, I, I'm happy to try. <laughs> You know that. You know what I'm saying. <laughs> I've been called that too. <laughs> um, I had to regain my language. I'm not fully fluent uh, since I was 16, but I can relate. Uh, a very similar story with Site C and um, South Indian Lake uh, and the CRD and the river systems that we're all connected with. Um, yeah, the, uh, there's two, so many levels with, of this that I'll try to uh, articulate here. As far as run of the river and uh, less impact dams, I mean, those don't exist in northern Manitoba. They're mega projects. I mean, just pour concrete into rivers, dam up and raise, flood, flood lakes and rivers. Um, they actually tried to portray Wasquatam, which is the last completed project in 2012, as a run of the river, and then basically the people from the World Commission on Dams told them, you, you don't have a clue what you're talking about, basically. So they've gone away from trying to sell that. I mean, it is a, it's just falsehood. So no, um, there is no run of the river dams operated in uh, northern Manitoba. They're all mega dams. Bottom line, uh, the one way I've, I've described uh, Manitoba Hydro and the Manitoba government is you know, they're, they're drunk on water and addicted to dams, and they seriously need an intervention. I mean, uh, there's a little bit of humor in there, but, you know, they, they just don't know any different. They, they resist change. They res re resist uh, existing technologies. They resist diversity, like wind and solar. I mean, I've sat in rooms and hearings where, I mean, they're just brushed off as alternatives. And knowing, I mean, in 2004, when they were proposing the Wasquatam project and... I mean, their claim to fame was they had 10 linear feet of documentation uh, on why this thing is this, but expert, act, uh, expert told them, you're, you're probably wrong. You know, fracking was, I'm not supportive of fracking, but was coming online and just lower energy costs. But no, they had blinders on, keep, keep going. And meanwhile, they're, they're going forward with the kiosk was at this moment they're pouring concrete into rivers, knowing full well this dam will lose money for about 40 years. Manitoba Hydro is $23.6 billion in debt as of this month, and some people believe there'll be $40 billion in debt, and a large portion of that is going to, to co construct these dams, knowing full well they won't produce as much revenue and almost no profit for the very foreseeable future. And yes, we will take, we will again share some information on uh, perhaps joining, uh, at least on the Alliance and joining forces. We are basically uh, all regional, but also national and international uh, uh, body. We have a member, many member organizations, and we'll provide you something with a conference coming up in November I where we're reaching up, out. Put that up on the there screen. it is. Yeah, so, I understand. I believe some of the people in our network are in connection with some people at Site C, although I personally would also really like to uh, yeah, follow that up because I've watched it with sort of incredulity. It's so similar to Manitoba and it's so um, retrograde and um, so obviously a bad idea in, in so many ways and yet they're going ahead. And I think it's a similar thing. It's somehow, it's so, it's like an ocean liner. It's so hard to turn it around and um, and yet, you're watching it, and it's so obvious that um, it, these things are com 
as you say, these technologies are obsolete. I think um, we're up against a bunch of myths that, that um, you know, we have to try to undo them. Some of them are just the colonial myths, right, that anything indigenous people say is uh, invalid, <laughs> you know, um, that hunting societies are obsolete and when really actually they're the way of the future. And, um, Anyway, we want to, we are holding this, we've held on annual gatherings for a number of years. This upcoming one in November, we were, we were hoping to broaden out, have people from across Canada and also internationally, and to talk more broadly ab about the, this broad issue of, of the continuance of hydroelectric dam building um, in this era and, and how to tackle that. And we w are very much in solidarity with uh, the people at Site C and would like to work with them. So thank you for that. I think we're a little over time already. Um, I'd like to thank. <laughs> I'd like to thank everyone very much for coming and for um, joining us in such a, a beautiful way. I really, really appreciate it from my heart. Thank you. Um, and so uh, please do come and talk to us afterwards if you'd like to continue um, the conversation and, and to network or, you know, to join forces. And um, I'd like to ask um, Shirley to end our session with a prayer. Thanks. Igosani kisimanto. Tapui nanasko mo intayana notes. No guana say he de we pita magi, chico go gagi pinto tagua. Ego tae hu, kise de mit nan. Ego cigais into tamaya, nanas common, anots, ego cigais you, wapataman. Ego gista, capiga moi mustata, kidi so gapoin, mina gagi gi. Ita puitama, kaisip motatain, mina nis nan. Iwichi hea, kaisia gotama, taisip motata, ego tamiste. Kinanas komit nan, kisimanto. Amen.